Today on the John Ankerberg Show, statistics show that about 70% of Christian young people who attend church regularly in high school will drop out or step away from their Christian faith when they leave to attend a secular college or university. Why are they leaving behind the faith in which they were raised? Students who enter the university quickly realize they're not in Sunday school anymore. Secular professors challenge their beliefs of how Christianity began, who Jesus really was. Can we believe that he rose from the dead? How did we get the Bible? And can we really trust the information we find there? 32% of Christian students said they left their faith behind because of intellectual skepticism or doubt. Their faith didn't make any sense to them anymore, or there were too many questions they didn't think could be answered. 63% of teenage Christians said they do not believe that Jesus is the son of the one true God. 51% said they do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. 68% said they do not believe that the Holy Spirit is a real entity. And only 33% said that the church will play a part in their lives when they leave home. But I believe this trend can be reversed. And so I've entitled our new television series, what your son or daughter needs to know before they go to the university so they don't fall away from the faith. We will also help those watching the NBC television miniseries, AD, who have questions about the life of Jesus, his resurrection, and how the apostles spread the gospel. What evidence assures us that this all actually happened and was not fabricated by the early Christians? My guest today, who will lead us through this discussion, is Dr. Daryl Bach, one of the leading historical Jesus scholars in our country and one of the world's foremost authorities on the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. He is Senior Research Professor of New Testament Studies at Dallas Theological Seminary and has authored over 30 books and appeared on ABC, CNN, Fox, and the Discovery Channel. I invite you to join us for this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. We've got a very important program for you today. It has to do with your sons, your daughters, your grandchildren that are going to the college or university. Maybe it's their first year, their second year. I'm concerned about, will they be able to maintain their faith? Before students enter the university, among other questions, I really believe they need to know how to answer the following questions. How did Christianity begin? Is the information in the New Testament books the best historical evidence there is for what Jesus said and did? What evidence shows us that Jesus was not just another religious teacher, but he was actually God in human flesh? And when were these books written and who were they written to? And how do we know that Jesus really rose from the dead on Easter morning, leaving an empty tomb behind? Now, when students enter their first days at the university, they, they quickly realize they're not in Sunday school class anymore. There are certain things that they need to know about in terms of defending their faith. And I've got one of the best scholars in the world here today that's going to help us explain how critical scholars are going to come after your students and what is the evidence that they can present to defend the beliefs that we hold to. My guest is Dr. Daryl Bach. He's one of the leading historical Jesus scholars in our country, one of the world's foremost authorities on the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. He's Senior Research Professor of New Testament Studies at Dallas Theological Seminary. And anytime they have a big squabble on, on network television, where there's a theological issue at stake, especially in terms of the historical Jesus, Daryl's usually there. He's been on there for ABC, CNN, Fox, and the Discovery Channel, among just a few. Now, Daryl, I want you to explain what is happening when these students enter class those first days, and what's the evidence that they can use to answer the questions? How do they argue? Well, when they walk into class, or even when they just walk onto campus, they're dealing with uh, questions about, is there a God? Uh, is the Bible what it says it is? Uh, can we trust the New Testament? 
did Jesus even exist and how much do we know about him? So it's very, very different than when you go to church. You know, when you go to church, you open up the Bible, you've got the content. Your warrant for establishing what you believe is right there in the text. You can pick the page, you cite the verse, and you go on to the discussion. What's happening in the universities is, is that these pages, in effect, are, 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 they aren't being ripped out, but they have to be put in, if you They're will. They're all being challenged. They're all being challenged. And so the question is, how do you know Jesus really said that. How do you know those books belong to the authors that they're claimed to belong to? How do you know that what is said here really reflects what happened in the first century? And you can't answer that question by simply saying, well, the Bible says it, because the Bible has gone from being the answer to being the question. Yeah, we're saying for these students that this is not a book that just dropped out of heaven and landed on the street and you pick it up and you can say, this is the authoritative source. You're saying we have historical manuscripts. We've got evidence that is solid. In fact, it's the best evidence about the early Christians and Jesus that exists. Yeah, what's happening is the student's walking into a bazaar and he's hearing a lot of comments about what the Bible is. And he's hearing a lot of questions about what the Bible is and whether it can be trusted, whether it can be believed. And if all he's gotten in Sunday school before he gets there is the Bible is true and that's the end of it, then for someone for whom you've got to show some merit to what it is that's going on in the Bible, that's not good enough. So we need students who are prepared to answer these questions. We need students who are aware of what the discussions are. We need students who are able to say, um, we're aware of what these conversations are. We know and have heard some of what you're going to be saying to us. And there is a conversation to be had here. And in the midst of that conversation, we're committed to the fact that when you look at it really, really carefully, there's a solid case that can be made that the Bible is what it purports let to me, be. Let me take one statement that they'll probably all hear, okay? So mom and dad, listen, this is one, if you send your kid to the, a secular university or college, they're gonna all hear this one, okay? The gospel is not really based on what Jesus said or taught to his disciples, but it gradually evolved and emerged as simply the loudest majority voice during the first centuries of the Christian era. What does that mean? What are the critics talking about? And how do you unscramble that if you're a Christian student? Well, the critic is claiming that the theology that we see in the New Testament is not a product, a, a direct product of the ministry of Jesus, or even in some cases, the writings of the apostles, because they're distancing scripture from both those sources. What they're arguing is it's a reflection, a, a, a later reflection, a late first century reflection usually, of theological developments that come later. And so one of, the, one of the parts of the conversation is to show how the date of the writings of these texts, even though they're decades removed from the events, actually do reflect the events themselves. We're going to be talking about the gap between the time when the events took place, somewhere in the early 30s, to the time when the Gospels in particular were written. Uh, dates ranging from the late 50s all the way up to the 90s. Uh, some people put the dates later, 80s and 90s themselves. That distance isn't so important as much as the fact that it's out here somewhere. Yeah. You're talking about Jesus living about up till 30, 33 AD, died, rose from the dead. Then you have the apostles, and this is the gap. That's right. And then when, when they finally got around to putting down their thoughts into books, okay, or letters, the fact is that starts coming out 40, 50, 60 in mm -hmm. that area. So the gap we're talking about is what do the Christians have in this early period and how do we know they didn't do a lot of inventing about Jesus between the time he actually lived to where we got the information. And that's what now. they're going to hear in the classroom. They're going to hear the suggestion in the classroom that something has gone on between the time the events took place in Jesus' life and the apostles were walking with Jesus till the time the stuff got written down. And, 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 and some of it isn't just elaboration. Everyone recognizes that there's reflection going on, that people thinking about what it is that Jesus did, the implications of it, you know, they realize the depth of what he does. There, there is development going on there, but beyond that development, they're going to hear things like there were events that were invented, there were details that were missed or, or improperly put forward. There are going to be all kinds of things that are happening in this gap period. And this gap period is difficult because it's part of an oral culture. And in an oral culture, you don't have written sources. All that you have are what people shared verbally. That evidence of what took place is actually gone. So you've got a vacuum that you're dealing with. And teachers are feeling, filling in that vacuum with one set 
of ideas as to what's going on. And what we're going to suggest is, is that there's another set of things that are going on that you need to be aware of. Yeah. How do you counter that? Well, the first thing is to be aware of how they go about doing this. And the way they go about doing this is they do point out differences and angles, different things that are being said between the documents. So they play off of the differences in the documents. And then they fill in that gap with their answer. This obviously, the first source didn't say this. We don't have any evidence of it up to this point. So this new thing, this new thing is something that's coming from the writer. It's coming from somewhere else. It doesn't go back to Jesus. That's how they're, they're dealing with the material. What we would suggest is, is that there is an oral tradition process. The oral tradition process is a much bigger pool of things that the church is aware of than simply what's written down. And people are making choices about what it is that they present. And so one writer chooses one set of details, another writer may work with another set of details that they're aware of in the tradition. And so that's not invention. Difference doesn't equal invention and difference doesn't equal contradiction. For sure. I mean, just think of all the people that saw Jesus do a miracle. I mean, he's doing miracles, miracles, miracles. He's teaching in different places. So guys that are in that village, they hear it. They got a slice of Jesus' life, okay? And they might write down that little slice, and another guy who was there, he might write it down. It's like a guy seeing an accident, four people seeing an accident. They, they all have little different details, same accident, all right? This information has been put into the New Testament in terms of how did Matthew see it? How did Mark see it? How did Luke record it, you know? And how did, how did the Apostle John remember it? And how did they structure it? Now, they didn't just do a photocopy of the first one and said, yeah, I, I was there, that happened, photocopy, put my name on it. They added other things that they thought was important, probably because they were talking to different groups of people. Yeah, in fact, in the case of the Gospel of John, about 88% of the Gospel of John isn't replicated in either Matthew, Mark, or Luke. So it's clear that John came along and said, I'm going to give you a whole fresh take on what's going on with Jesus and tell you a whole bunch of things that, that aren't in what we call the synoptic tradition. The synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And, and it's these kinds of differences that are played off of skeptically. Even beyond that, you actually have an additional problem because this is a full court press that you're getting. Not only are there questions about Jesus, not only questions about the Bible, there's questions even about God. So the idea of God performing miracles and that kind of thing, that's also on the table. So literally when you go and you open this Bible and you sit there and say, you know, the opening words say God created, or later on it says God said. I mean, that's, those are two word sentences and you can't know about the first word in that sentence. Yeah. All right, folks, I want to remind you that when Bill O'Reilly did his show on Killing Jesus, the book that he wrote, he told the audience, and he also put it in the bibliography, that Daryl was the one who can show you how to go through the sources. Which are the sources that have the most weight, that are the most credible? How should you weight these? And where is the real evidence at? And I want him to take a, a, a simple illustration that I think you're probably familiar with, 1 Corinthians 15, and talk about how the written and the oral passing out of information actually can take us right back to the events themselves. This is absolutely fascinating. Stick with us, we'll be right back. If you would like to have all of the information in our new series entitled, so you don't fall away from the faith. All three television programs in this series with Dr. Daryl Bach are available on DVD for a gift of $39. This series contains the information your son or daughter needs to know before they go to the university. And you may order these programs now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. All right, we're back. We're talking with Dr. Daryl Bach, and we are talking about what do your students need to know before they go to the university. You know that the universities are skeptical in terms of their approach toward Jesus, the Bible, and God. So how can you protect, how can the students defend themselves? What's the evidence? And we're talking about how this information came down. How do we know we have actually accurate information about Jesus himself, okay? You can't just open up the Bible and say, I got a verse, but you can open up the Bible and say, I've got information from people 
that would be solid evidence to anyone in looking at ancient history that uh, we can see a line of progression that goes right back to Jesus. And let me explain it from 1 Corinthians 15, and Daryl can explain it better. Paul writes this book in 55 A.D. He had first preached this information in 50 A.D. So if Jesus died about 30, we're talking 20 to 25 years later, we got this book on the newsstands in Corinth, all right? What did he say in 1 Corinthians 15? He says, For I delivered to you, to the Corinthians, as of first importance, of what I also received. When did he receive it? Daryl's going to tell us. That Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. Then Jesus appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that He appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, He appeared to me also. What is the significance? Joe Kim Jeremiah, the Jewish scholar, looked at 1 Corinthians 15, these verses, and boy, he got a, a bird's eye view of what was going on. Tell, tell us what is going on. This is the core theology of the church that's being presented in traditional form. What we need to remember is, is that in the first century, we're in a primarily oral culture. The way things were passed on was by word of mouth. They didn't write books, generally speaking. Book, book writing was very, very rare. And so the way things were communicated was by passing them on through an oral tradition process. Jews were very good at this oral tradition process when they wanted to remember something. And so this little balanced line that you get, you know, according to the scriptures, he was buried and he was raised according to the scriptures, it's, it's made memorable on purpose uh, because you're supposed to recall this core theology. What Paul received is the idea that he received this tradition. What he's teaching is what the other apostles are teaching. That's the point that he's making there. And the resurrection is a central doctrine he's getting ready to defend in that chapter. Another very important point that's coming through is the idea of this, of this doctrinal summary and the idea that these appearances are things that happened in history. Um, Jesus dying and Jesus being buried is on the same plane as Jesus being raised from the dead. It's all history. Now, one of the things students will hear in the classroom is, is that there are theological statements and there are historical statements, and you can't mix the two. So the idea that Jesus is raised from the dead is a theological statement. It's not a historical statement. And I think it's important to see that in this summary, the idea that Jesus died and was buried is put on the same plane as the idea that Jesus was raised from the dead. It's all being treated as a unit that belongs together, and the appearances are being presented as a unit, a fact of history, things that happen. We're 20 years away from the event, but the more important thing is the event that Paul is describing, the theology that's being taught, actually goes back to his conversion. His conversion goes right on top of the events that we're talking about. He was converted within a year or two of Jesus' crucifixion. Yeah, so if you have Jesus dying at 30, Paul becomes a Christian here about 32 A.D., meets with the guys in Jerusalem at 35, but he's saying, at, right, at 32, he received something. Who did he receive it from? Well, he, he claims in Galatians that his experience of the Lord was direct as a result of the appearance. But the theology that goes with it is what he heard preached. You know, he was persecuting that at one time. He was saying, I don't believe that. I think those guys are dead wrong. And he, and he was arresting people and, and supporting people who were martyred like Stephen when it took place. But that's evidence that people before Paul got there two years later were already preaching this kind of a message. Yeah, in fact, and this is very, very important to appreciate, when Paul has that appearance of Jesus and the Lord says to him, it is I who you're persecuting, he has to have a grid against which to understand that appearance. And the grid that he has that, he, that allows him to understand that appearance is the preaching of the apostles and the claim the tomb was empty, Jesus is raised from the dead, he's alive, he is the Messiah, he is the Lord. Now, Paul didn't believe that until Jesus appeared to him. When Jesus appeared to him, he went, oops, I made a mistake. His whole worldview flipped. And in the midst of that, uh, we get we get the uh, emergence of probably you know one of the most influential obviously figures of the first century in the early Christian movement. Yeah, and and Paul was basically encouraging other people that he was writing to, 
you know, if you don't believe me, go and check it out with these other 500 witnesses that, were, that saw him at one time. I mean, even the appearances themselves, there's evidence that knocks out some of the theories that you'll hear at school. You know, there was hallucination, or it was grief, or it was this or that. Talk a little bit more about that. Well, what will happen again is, is they will go to the resurrection accounts and they'll talk about differences between the resurrection accounts and, and try and present that as if that undercuts the claim that there's a resurrection. And, that, and they'll suggest that shows that the stories were made up later, that we aren't dealing with real events. But there are certain things about the way these stories are told that show that they're not invented events. Perhaps the most prominent thing right at the beginning, and we'll talk more about this later, but the most prominent thing is women as the initial witnesses because culturally women didn't count as witnesses. If you were inventing this story and trying to make it fit the culture, the last people you would pick to defend an idea that's not popular, that you're trying to really sell to a culture, and it's a difficult idea of physical bodily resurrection, you wouldn't pick women as witnesses to be your leading, your leading advocates of the cause. Yeah. Do you remember sitting in class, both of us when we went to the university, we had non-Christian professors. You weren't even a Christian yet. I, I was a Christian, but I didn't have one professor all through the university, okay? Until I got to grad school, I had my first Christian professor. And I can remember having them say things to me that I didn't know the background. I didn't have the information. How would you encourage students that might already be a year in, and they've heard a whole truckload of stuff how can you encourage them that there's solid evidence here? They haven't just heard it yet. Well, there are two things to say to them. The first thing to say to them is there is solid evidence. There's a part of the story that they're often not hearing in the classroom that's important. They may not have even heard it at church before they got to the university. That's part of why we're doing the show. But the second thing is, is that you need to realize that the people that you're up against in the classroom have given their lives to studying what it is that you're talking about. You're not going to be able in, in a couple of weeks to load up and walk in and, and, and dump on them. You're going to have to really engage uh, with the whole perspective that's coming at you and be aware of what's happening as it's happening. And then step back, take a breath, and realize that you're probably only getting one half of the conversation that happens among people who study the Bible. Yeah, folks, we're just starting out with this, and I think that you can see the importance of this information. And uh, next week, we're going to take the topic of what is the historical evidence of how Christianity actually began? There are many, many theories about how Christianity began. I mean, you can just look at the Discovery Channel or you can see CNN at Christmas or Easter, and they got a whole bunch of ideas that you think are really wild, okay? How Christianity really began. We're going to talk about that next week, so I hope that you'll join us. Stay tuned for scenes from next week's program. Now, if you would like to have all of the information in our new series so you don't fall away from the faith, all three television programs in the series are available on DVD for a gift of $39. It contains the information your son or daughter needs to know before they leave home and go off to attend a secular college or university. And it features one of the world's leading historical Jesus scholars, Dr. Daryl Bach, who answers the questions, how did Christianity begin? How do we know that the information in the New Testament books is the best historical evidence there is for what Jesus said and did? And then how do we know we can trust what we are told about Jesus? Was the message Jesus preached changed over time by the early Christians? Or has Jesus' core message remained the same until our day? How did the early Christians come to believe that the apostles' books and letters were to be considered scripture, equal in authority with the Old Testament scriptures? And who decided which books would become part of the canon? All three programs in this series are available on DVD for a gift of $39. We also taped a second series called Questions the World Will Ask About Your Faith. In this series, we'll help those watching the NBC television miniseries A.D. who have questions about the life of Jesus, His death and resurrection, and how the apostles spread the gospel to the world. What evidence assures us that this all actually happened and was not fabricated by the early Christians? And what evidence shows Jesus clearly claimed to be God? 
How do we know Jesus really rose from the dead and actually appeared to over 500 people? Can the resurrection appearances be explained away by psychological theories? The three programs in this series are also available on DVD for a gift of $39. Then third, we are making available two new study guides with extensive notes that parallel our two television series. Each study guide is available for a gift of $8 or for five or more copies for $5 each. And finally, I'm going to include three other important series in this package. First, the battle to dethrone Jesus. Could the apostles and companions of the apostles have written a completely new story about Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? During the early period of time, when the early Christians did not have the New Testament, how did they know what was true Christian belief and what was not? Well, the four programs in this series with New Testament scholars Dr. Daniel B. Wallace and Dr. Daryl Bach answer all of these questions. Second, our series, What About the Missing Gospels and Lost Christianities? Is the traditional Orthodox Christianity that we were taught in church true Christianity? What about the missing Gospels and alternative Christianities that archaeologists have discovered? What do books like the Da Vinci Code, which sold more than 81 million copies, and other popular literature teach about Jesus? What historical evidence refutes their assertions? And then third, a response to Bill O'Reilly's book, Killing Jesus, Part 1 and Part 2. My guests again are historian Dr. Gary Habermas and New Testament scholar Dr. Daryl Bach, who critique Bill O'Reilly's view of Jesus that's portrayed in his book and in his upcoming movie, which Bill O'Reilly says will break new ground in chronicling the life of the most famous human being who ever lived. Now, all six of these television series, containing 22 half-hour programs, plus the two study guides, are available for a gift of only $99. You may order this special package now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. We may also order these materials at our website at jashow.org. Next week on The John Ankerberg Show, now, Paul's an important figure to jump the theology back to. He's writing in the 50s and 60s, but he's writing about experiences that he had in the 30s. to learn how to start a relationship with Jesus Christ, go to our website at jashow.org and click on Pray to Accept Jesus Christ as Your Savior.